Funding for Current Conversations is provided by University of Oklahoma President's Office, University of Oklahoma Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversation. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. Today we're on location at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Washington, D.C., and we're going to be speaking to one of the main presenters. Phil Yu is the author of the Angry Asian Man blog, and he's one of the most important voices in the Asian American community today, and we're very pleased to have him on the show. Honored and humbled to be here today, and uh, also to be honest, I I'm, I'm totally freaked out. Uh, <laughs> but I want to I want to thank the Encore organizers for inviting me and and granting me this incredible privilege. So uh, so my name is Phil Yu. I run a blog called AngryAsianMan.com. I guess that makes me the Angry Asian Man. <laughs> but uh, but please call me Phil. Here we are in location at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity on Locale and one of the keynote speakers, Phil Yu. Thank you so much for taking this time to uh, talk to us. My pleasure, thanks for having me. A, a lot of people know your, your blog, uh, Angry Asian Man. If somebody were to go to your blog, who hasn't been there before, say over a week, week's time, what would they find in your blog? I think you'd, <laughs> it'd be hard to pinpoint it being about any one thing other than uh, it, it, it's covering news and culture from the Asian American community. So I cover pop culture, po politics, media, crime, just like weird, random internet stuff, entertainment stuff. It's a kind of a little bit of everything um, from one perspective. It's, it's mine. And, uh, but most importantly, I think I, I like to publish content that I would like to read. And so, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of everything, I think. You're describing it sort of casually as a little bit of everything, but it is clearly struck a chord with a lot of people. It, d does the uh, angry Asian man, does that persona, is that, is that what struck a chord? Uh, Asian Americans feeling that at some level they are angry or they should be angry. What do you think is going on there? I think it's a couple things. I mean, certainly angry, the angry persona or this, I, this attitude, I think, of, of being able to speak out and say something and say it with a little bit of, uh, with a little bit of teeth. I think that um, that speaks to something in terms of like, I think a lot of Asian Americans feel like they need to keep their head down and not, not stand out, you know. And um, that attitude is, um, I think, it attracts them to the blog. The other part of it is that, you know, mainstream media often renders Asian Americans kind of invisible or a, dist mm -hmm. a very distorted view of what our realities are like. And I think the blog offers a view of something, you know, either either you get to look and see what. Um, maybe a, a glimpse of one sliver of the Asian American community. But it's also like, oh, I think this, this blog, it reflects my experience, and I really appreciate that. I, I've heard you talk where you'll say, well, you know, I'm not the angry Asian man. You sort of go to great lengths to say that. Somebody has suggested that perhaps the angry Asian man persona is like Superman, and Phil Yu is Clark Kent. Superman has kind of you know, stepped out a little bit, but you're still Clark Kent in the background. Does that kind of work for you? Do you like that? Uh, there's a, I, I think there's a certain element of that. Not, I mean, certainly because I am a huge fan of Superman and comic book stories <laughs> and such. So um, I've never consciously thought about that, but definitely there's there is an element where, like, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm not a particularly angry person. Uh, I think I'm a, I'm a joy to be around. But uh, I also think that um, the stuff that I say online, um, it, it definitely. Uh, it comes from a place where I feel like a little more empowered when mm -hmm. I take to the keyboard and I'm able to publish this stuff and maybe a little bit more powerful than I do just in regular everyday life. Do you see patterns in the way that Asians are depicted in the popular media and TV, for example? Um, I, I think I mentioned something to you that I don't think you've actually seen the elementary show. It's a Sherlock Holmes uh -huh. sort of spinoff where uh, Lucy Liu is Watson and she's kind of nerdish and linear and Sherlock Holmes is this white guy, just his mind's all over the place and uh -huh. he's creative. I mean, you see that kind of reinforcement of a very narrow kind of stereotype very often in the culture. Well, for me, I would say that most, it's mostly marked Asian American representation in 
pop culture, I think it's mostly marked by invisibility. I mean, we just, I, we rarely get to see Asian Americans um, at all. At all, you know what I mean? And so when we do, we, have, we, we take a magnifying glass and we scrutinize it to yeah. death, like something like that show where if, if there were a bunch of uh, Asian Americans on TV shows everywhere, we would just be able to look at that and not, not needle um, the character so much, you know. In that, in that case, I think it's actually kind of interesting that, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes is one of the most filmed characters in all of Western literature, you know, in, Western, in movies, television. Um, to see an Asian woman play a role that's traditionally played by a white male, white yeah. British male, I think that's actually kind of revolutionary. I mean, in fact, the part I left out, she's a doctor mm. and who's acting as his, uh, as his kind of sidekick. Yeah. Um, Abercrombie and Finch, this was a few years ago, they had this um, uh, initiative called uh, Wong Brothers Laundry Service, Two Wongs Make It White. Reaction to that? Uh, it's uh, one of those things that gets a lot of attention because there isn't that much. I am familiar, <laughs> very familiar with that incident. And actually, that incident is one of, it happened very early on in the life of my blog. And um, it actually shaped the direction of, um, of my blog in that, you know, that thing happens. It, it, you know, Abercrombie and Fitch comes out with these t-shirts, this line. It's actually, everyone remembers the Wong Brothers t-shirt, this fake laundry service with the tagline, with two Wongs can make it white. It was actually one of several Asian-themed graphic tees that Abercrombie and Fitch came out at that time. These were actual shirts that were on the shelves, sold in stores. Um, you know, the reaction to that, what's, what's significant about that is, one, that Abercrombie and Fitch thought that it was okay to put these out, right? Yeah. I believe a, a PR person actually, really, when, they, when they sort of came out with their apology about it, they, they said, we thought that Asians would love these T-shirts, which is like, I can't believe that. Um, For most people, there's going to be an echo in the background of two wrongs make a right, two wrongs don't make a right, yeah. and then white is in the place of right. Yeah. I mean, that, that doesn't have a good feel to me, just no. hearing it now. It's pretty awful. Um, the other side of the, what's significant about the, that, though, is that um, it, people reacted to that, and they mobilized, mm -hmm. and they called for boycotts. They protested in front of stores of Abercrombie & Fitch, and they, they said, we're, this is, we're not going to take this, you know what I mean? And that, that, to me, is significant. It was largely fueled by young people, and it was fueled by an online movement, you know? Yeah. And that was one of the first times in, my blo in, in sort of the life of my blog I was able to... You played I, a part in that. I, I, yeah, I was one of several uh, websites that were, were you know, sort of uh, bringing attention to this. And it was a time where I, was like, I actually feel empowered because yeah. I was able to sort of speak out and say something. And, um, you know, it was an illustration to me. I was like, oh, I can use this website. I can say stuff, and it can move people to action. You know, yeah. It doesn't have to be just me ranting and raving about one thing. It's like... People, I can compel people to, to do something, you know. And that's that, very exciting. That was, a, that was a powerful illustration for me. In your lifetime, I, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot for a personal response here. Have you seen significant changes in national attitudes about race and race relations, would you say, in your lifetime? I definitely think there is a more, um, it's a weird way, there's a more openness to talk about it because people are like, we have to talk about this. It, it's getting, we're getting into situations where not talking about it is getting it's more trouble. You know, I think a lot of people want to be, you know, they, they, they think that it, it's uncomfortable, um, and so they avoid the topic altogether. But that's just not getting us in, going, taking us anywhere productive. Um, on the other hand, I also think that um, the, I think the conversations can go very, they, they can go sour very quickly. You know, uh, especially online, um, I think that the internet has provided us with a very incredible way to communicate with each other um, and have dialogue about this. But it's also a place where that dialogue can go awry very quickly. Yeah. Are you saying that maybe we have a desire to talk about race nationally, or we know that it's needed, but we don't quite know how to have that conversation? Is yeah. that where we're at? Yeah. I think the vocabulary, and the syntax, and all that stuff. It's not quite there and I, for a lot of people, and I think we need to work together to come up with that. Um, you know, there's definitely des the desire for that. The desire, The need yeah. and the necessity, you know. Right, really the necessity. I think a lot of people would describe you as somebody with a calling, the way you've 
come to this this blog and and what it's meant to people and I think you've actually expressed that to your, your, yourself was there a an event in your life or possibly a series of events either way where you felt that this calling and and the work that you could do was necessary and needed and things kind of crystallized for you either a single event or several events I can't say it was a single event it was definitely a gradual process okay because the blog itself started so much as just a place for me to express myself it was just I I didn't think anybody was gonna read it and so I was like this is this is really cathartic for me and I really enjoy doing this you know Somewhere along the way, I realized that this was bigger than just me. Yeah. And that's where the sort of the calling comes into play. And I realized that I had an audience. I had people who were reading the blog, and it meant something to them as well. And, you know, it, it, I can't pinpoint to any one event. But, you know, I do remember reading uh, on one of your blogs uh, uh, a documentary, Who Killed Vincent Chen, and also an episode of Different Strokes yeah. where you saw an Asian... Uh, character on TV for the first time. Those, I think, those were, must have been threshold moments for you. In certainly, a way. Uh, certainly in my lifetime. Um, learning about the Vincent Chin case was. Uh, would, would you tell us just briefly for people that don't know about the Vincent Chin case, what sure, happened? Sure. Sure. Um, well, in Detroit, uh, in 1982, uh, Vincent Chin was a young Chinese American man. He was out on the town having a good time when he got into a fight, an argument with two men uh, at a strip club. He was out on, for his bachelor party. They got into it, and you know, during their argument, the, the two men, they, they blamed him. They blamed people like you, uh, because now we're, we're out of work. He was talking about uh, US auto workers, tensions with Japan. Um, and so the, the, the fight spilled out into the street where mm. it got physical. Uh, they chased Vincent Chin down and basically beat him to death uh. with a baseball bat. Um, the subsequent trial and the case, it galvanized the Asian American community who wanted justice for Vincent Chin. Mm -hmm. um, it was not just a, a single Chinese American event. Yeah. It wasn't a Japanese American one. It was it was an Asian a pan Asian movement for justice for Vincent. This is like the Rodney King for it, the Asian community. It was a, it was it was a hate crime before even hate crimes were sort of doc, being documented in yeah. that way. Um, I learned about the case nearly two decades after it happened. Mm. I'd never heard of it. No one ever bothered to tell me about it. It was not something I read in a history book. I learned about it in an Asian, Asian American Studies course. Um, because I watched this documentary, Who Killed Vincent Chin. Mm -hmm. I watched that film, and my mind was blown. Yeah. My, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And um, because I was able to recognize, like, this situation, man, it could have been me, you know. It could have been someone I love, you know, and it was, because it, it, it happened for nothing, you know. Um, but learning about that, it enraged me. But also learning about this movement for justice mm -hmm. that, mobilize the community that was empowering to me that was like i i understand this now i understand that i have a place somewhere in in the pursuit of civil rights and racial justice most narratives that i had read up to then was pretty simplified in terms of like ra like racism is bad but in, no one had ever told me like where do asians fit in in this conversation in terms of um it really came home to you yeah at it, that point. It, it, it hit home in a very real way yeah. this was a history that involved me you know, I, I've seen that this this one episode of Different Strokes has is drawn you back several <laughs> times. What was that about? There was something very powerful there for you. So I grew up really loving movies, TV, and pop culture. Um, I just watched an unhealthy amount of television when I was growing up. Um, one of my favorite sh shows was Different Strokes. Um, this one particular episode was uh, was particularly striking because. It, the storyline involved a Korean, a Korean man who shows up at the doorstep, you know. And um, the, fa the very fact that there was a Korean person, they named him as Korean, and he was a character on this show, I jumped up from my seat. I'm like, he's Korean. There's a Korean man on TV, you know. And I, it was so, so, because I'd never seen any, that was the first time I ever seen anybody who was um, named as Korean on a TV show. It's I think I heard you say before that you ran in the other room, told your grandmother, and she didn't care, so yeah. you ran back and just watched yeah. it. I, my, yeah, <laughs> I just I tried to find somebody who would care, and like, nobody really cared, so it was just something I was sort of, I, 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 it was delightful, it was exciting, you know, and it really spoke to this need of like, 
you know, I, I, I grew up loving movies and TV and pop culture, but like I never saw my experience reflected in that in any, any way. And seeing that was kind of this weird, in this like really silly mo TV moment, but it was this weird validation that like, you, I matter somehow. Somewhere out yeah. there in, in TV land, my experience has some sort of meaning, you know? And um, you know, even at that young age, I kind of, I really appreciated that, you know, that validation. I, I had this sense of purpose, and you know it was fun. So, over a dozen years later, I'm still doing this, and uh, along the way, I found an audience, and I found a professional calling. Angry Asian Man is now one of the most widely read websites covering the Asian American community. Uh, in social settings, when I'm feeling a little more truthful, I. Uh, I don't tell people I'm in web development. Um, I usually introduce myself vaguely as a writer or a blogger. Um, the, but depending on when I'm asked and depending on who's asking, I also find myself playing the part of journalist, activist, critic, cheerleader, gossip, and town crier. I didn't ask for any of these roles, but I recognize the privilege and the power and the responsibility of wielding this platform. It's given me a voice to tell my story, my Asian American story. Most unexpectedly, I've also discovered a community. You know, somewhere along the way, the blog has cultivated this loyal, dedicated readership that uh, I affectionately refer to as Angry Asian America. I don't know exactly who these people are, uh, but a lot of them are college students who, like me many years ago, are exploring their own burgeoning, renewed sense of Asian American political identity and they're coming to the blog and referred to it as a resource. I, I know you're not a scholar, but you are somebody on the front lines of racial relations, and you see things that a lot of, a lot of other people aren't gonna see. What strikes you as the biggest obstacle out there to improved racial relations and to sort of end the invisibility of whole peoples, like a Asian peoples? What strikes you as the, as, as the biggest obstacle to, to moving things in the right direction? I think a lot of a lot of times we're uh, we have conversations online. There's a lot of dialogue happening online. It's a very powerful tool to get ideas across. But I think a lot of people are very interested in being right as opposed to, uh, you know, hearing each other out and having a, a true dialogue. Like, it's 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 it, as powerful a tool as something like Twitter is. It's nearly impossible to have a dialogue 140 characters at a time. Yeah. I I find that. Um, I love a lot of the stuff that happens on Twitter and the, the interactions people are able to have, but sometimes you just can't beat like a face-to-face -face conversation to really share ideas and learn something. Is know? it an unwillingness to listen, really listen to other people? You There's think, that, or? but that's that's a human condition, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. That's something, uh, but at least we need to recognize that. Um, and on top of that, I mean, I think we need more places for people to have that dialogue. and for my voice to come out, this person's voice to come out and say, like, you know, um, to have our individual struggles sort of cataloged and, 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 and spotlighted, I think. It's interesting that the internet is such a mixed bag in this regard. I heard an NPR show recently, this woman that does a, a, a show, uh, on, does show on the internet, and she was on an NPR, and uh, the things that she hears back, I mean, just unrepeatable, uh, just garbage, and I'm, I'm sure that you get just so much stuff that is unrepeatable that you just, how did this come to me? That I don't understand that part of it. Do you? The, the violence on the internet. Yeah, I mean, there is, um, I've received my share of hate mail in the 14 years I've been doing this. I've received a lot of stuff that, frankly, you just have to grow thick skin if you're gonna be on the internet and doing this. That's yeah. one thing. But the other part of that, it's like, yeah, I think there are, something about the anonymity of the, of the internet, yeah. it boldens people to say things that they would never say to your face. That's that's a huge part of it. And then sometimes people just they want to say, if, and given that that shroud of anonymity, they want to say the thing that will be the most hurtful thing, um, you know, to people on the internet. And I, I um, it it at some point you just you you have to actually ignore that because like, look, these people aren't really interested in having any kind of dialogue. It's just they just want to hurt, you know. Yeah, that that's so hard to hard to understand. Um, Again, asking for really kind of a personal response. 
do you just sense in your gut, or, or maybe it's an intellectual thing, in your lifetime, do you think there's going to be significant improvement in racial relations in the U.S. and the invisibility, removal of the invisibility of uh, so many ethnic communities? You, do you feel like that could happen in your lifetime? I have to feel like that will happen in my lifetime. Um, I have to know that there is, uh, or it's progress, and it's happening now as we speak. Like I have to, I have to latch on to that idea for my work to, um, to feel like it has meaning, to, to feel like it's going somewhere, to have, to have progress, you know. Um, so yes, I will, I will emphatically say yes. I, you're not, I you're an that. optimist, basically. I, I, I am an optimist. As, yeah. as angry of a guy that I am supposed to be, I'm also an optimist that, you know, and, and I, I, will, I will say, yeah, I'm working towards this goal, and I believe that it will happen. Do you, do, does is the angry Asian man blog is that does that have a, a different uh, uh, destination other than what it is now? Do you see that leading somewhere that where you'll do something different? Will you go on with the uh, angry Asian man blog and just build the audience? Where, what do you see as the future of that? I never expected to get as far as I have when I first started. You know, so I, I, I think I will just keep doing it as long as people are reading it. You know, I would love for the audience to grow more diverse and bigger, sure. Um, you know, the, the blog itself has afforded me so many interesting opportunities and other ways to express myself. So I've exp expanded to an audio podcast and a video talk show and lots of like different things that I never could have anticipated. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to see where it grows. And um, I'm know, probably I'm, not the first to suggest this to you, I'm sure, but I could easily imagine a book that would be best of, uh, you know, ang angry Asian man, uh, you, you know, compiled together. You're I mean, not the first person to suggest yeah, a book, yeah. and um, I, I'm, I'm very interested in in writing a book. <laughs> the other thing, the other consideration is like, man, who has the time? <laughs> I'm busy. I'm a busy Asian man. A lot of people who will see this discussion today will never get a chance to meet you, and they perhaps don't have a, a blog or a way to, you know, speak to the world. But they want to do something, you know. They they want to be on the right side mm -hmm. of, of of social justice. If there is one thing you could tell them that they could do that could be meaningful, not just busy work, but something real for people, what what would that one thing be? I would say uh, have a conversation. I mean, have a conversation with somebody. It, it really it's as simple as that. And don't come from a place of fear. Come from a place of trying to let's we're trying to understand each other here, you know. Um, I would say, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, I don't have a blog, I don't have that. It's like, you, if you have access to the internet, there's a place for you to do something. I think. And um, would it be a good idea for them to maybe try to connect with somebody they don't normally connect with, maybe somebody across a racial or a communal or an ethnic divide or something like that, and really try to listen to? That's that's certainly. That, that is an awesome thing to do, you know. Yeah. I, I find that it, it's even hard to have a conversation about race and these sticky topics, even with people who are of the same race, you know. Um, I think that we need to broach that so that it doesn't become so taboo, you know. I wonder if we don't need some national leadership in this regard, because you were saying this earlier, that there, there's a real desire out there. People are kind of bumping up against conversations they don't know how to have. Uh, I think you're providing that leadership, and maybe that's what we need to see more of is, people who can start these conversations that other people can continue. I think that's, uh, it's certainly what I, I, I want out of my blog. The, the, the content that I publish is like, is never meant to be the uh, be all and end all. And you know, I was, it was not supposed to be me just proclaiming this and putting it out there. Yeah. It was always supposed to be a conversation starter. Right, I, I know that you weren't uh, particularly focused on Encore before you came here and everybody really appreciated your uh, your wonderful talk and your presence here. Do, do you see this kind of organization is really having a function, maybe providing some of that leadership and get these conversations going that need to happen uh, as a result of this visit? Well, absolutely. In terms of the work that um, you know, everyone comes here and convenes and has these, you know, amazing workshops and comes to learn from each other. But they, after that, they have to go back to their individual, uh, you know, campuses and you know. And their work in higher education, you know, and that and and that's where a lot of this stuff is going to happen. That's where it happened for me, you know, uh, in ethnic studies and 
um, college was the time where like this all came together for me. And so to build that foundation for a community that is receptive to that, that's where this, the work is starting here, yeah. I, I, I've heard you talk about ethnic studies a couple of times. Would that be something you would recommend to people? I, I think it was a very formative experience for you to be in the Critical Asian program at Northwestern. Uh, would you talk about that just a little bit? What, what did that accomplish that you, you could see being a good thing for other people as well? Well, for me, it was certainly, it awakened this sort of idea of an Asian American political identity. You know, I, I, up to then, I think Asian American for me was just something I checked off on a box, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it was a category, because um, that's what I was. Um, but Asian American as a political identity, you know, what did I want my, this face to mean in the world, you know, and, and, and how did I want to talk about that? And, and um, because it comes with history and it comes with, um, you know, a lot of meaning outside of just like, this is what I look like, you know. Um, the history the, the his, and yeah. social history class. Of, and history of racism and discrimination in this country, immigration, all that stuff. It's, you know, it was enfolded in this class. And I, it suddenly, when I took these classes, I learned the history, it spoke to me. It spoke to my identity uh, in a way that no, maybe no history course had really spoken to me you know, before. You know? um, so I think that's certainly a very powerful way to connect to that. I, I think that people who are not who are not Asian Americans should take an Asian American studies class. I think someone who is not uh, Latino should take sort of a Chicano American studies class. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think that there is a lot of incredible things that can be learned from that curriculum and with each other. Thank you so much for being with us today, Phil. I, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And we're so glad that you could be with us today. Join us next time for more current conversation. Thank you for watching.